Thank you very much. A lot of people have asked me about the title to the book. And for those of you who haven't read the book, um, the title comes from an expression that, uh, uh, that originated in the United States. And let's see, sir, where are you from originally? Kentucky. Kentucky. So in Kentucky in 1849, if your best friend had come by your house and asked where you were, your mother might have said you were going to see the elephant. And what that meant at the time was that you had gone west to find your fortune in gold. And in the 1880s, the expression changes a little bit because the gold rushes die down. And it means that you've gone on a big adventure. You've gone to Asia or Africa or the Orient. And then in 1901, the expression just disappears. And I had the librarians at the Bancroft Library in Berkeley, who have a tremendous database of historical newspapers, look this up. And in 1901, it just, it's no longer used in the newspaper as a, an expression that somebody might have written. It's as if in 100 years' time, the phrase Murphy's Law were to disappear. And our great-great-grandkids would say, what does that mean? Who, who was Murphy? So I came across this expression in a letter that some gold miners had written that were collected in a book in a library. And it literally said, Mom, I'm going to see the elephant. Love, Russ. And he put it on the kitchen table, and that was the end of it. So when I was writing this book, I came across the expression. I thought, that's the perfect expression for my book. That captures the excitement and the adventure of what I want to capture. My story is about present-day San Francisco. And the city is really a character in the book. But this expression uh, captured what I wanted to capture um, with my title. So. That's the story of my title. I did have somebody say recently at a book reading, yeah, 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 that's nice that you have that story about the title. Uh, but in World War II, uh, that's expression we used uh, when we lost our virginity. So I like to say it means that you're going on an adventure. And just you leave it at that. So uh, the main character in my book is named Slater Brown. And he's the, the, the main character. And he's a young man who's come to San Francisco because he believes himself to be the greatest writer in the history of the world. Only he hasn't published anything yet. And I was walking down Polk Street in San Francisco in 2003. And in Polk Street, where Frank used to work uh, at Acorn Books, Polk Street in Atlanta might be Peachtree Street, or a street with some cafes and shops and a place that people are walking on the sidewalk. And I was walking down Polk Street, and I was passing a coffee shop. And just out of the corner of my eye, I saw a young guy in a coffee shop. And he was hunched over a table, and he was just writing away furiously. And around him were about 14 empty espresso cups. And every time he would finish writing a sentence, he would crumple up the page, and he'd throw it on the ground. And I stopped, and I watched him for a little bit. And I thought, this guy has come to San Francisco to be a writer. I can just tell. And I pulled my notebook out, and I'm taking notes of this young guy writing. And a little voice in my head said, you know, lots of people come to San Francisco to be a writer, or a painter, or a photographer, or an artist. You should pay attention to this. This is a type of person. And this may have happened to some of you in the room, but uh, once you get clued into something sometimes, it's amazing how it's, then it suddenly appears as if everybody in the world is into archery. If you get into archery, you start seeing archery. I love archery bumper stickers. And you see archery stores on the corner. Well, once I'd seen this character in this, in this coffee shop, I started to see him all over San Francisco, men and women, on the buses riding or in the park on a blanket. And so then my job became to follow this character around in my imagination. And I had to answer the question, what happens next? And that question is a really important question to a writer, because it's the question that drives the engine of a story. Uh, and I feel very self-satisfied telling you that I figured all this out, because the person who taught me that is my four-year-old son, Quinn. Because if anybody is a parent, anybody's ever read to a child, that's the only question they want answered when, they're re when you're reading a book to them, is what happens next. Writers have spent centuries developing very complicated theories about why they write, or what the point of writing is, and narrative uh, explication. And the whole thing can be boiled down to what happens next. Because after all, that's the question that Homer was uh, being asked around the campfire. And I'm not talking about Homer Simpson. I'm talking about uh, the Odyssey when he was telling that story originally. So I had to answer this question of what happens next to Slater. And so my job became to follow him around the city in my imagination. Uh, San Francisco is an, a wonderful, amazing city. It's a human zoo. And Slater uh, certainly gets into lots of uh, 
exciting trouble there. Uh, he gets a job with a third-rate newspaper called The Morning Trumpet. And it's been around since 1849, been around for about 150 years, and it's been going downhill 139 of those years. Even so, they're a little skeptical of Slater Brown. There's just something a little fishy about him. And so they say, if you're such a great writer, go find us a story. And they kick him out of their office, and they think they'll never see him again. And he goes out into the city, and in very short order, a series of things happen to him, and he becomes the most powerful person on the West Coast. And to find out more, you're going to have to buy the book, Abe. I'm counting on two copies for you. Because you're a chaplain. To, no, no, I'm just two copies. You're a chaplain and you're going to Iraq, and I think you could take it over there to... to, going to see the you're going to see the elephant. You're going on an adventure. I'm not talking about your virginity. It's none of my business. I'm not a virgin. Okay, all right, all right, all right. Two grandkids. <laughs> well, two grandkids. Well, each of them might like a book. Francisco? Yes. I was, I, I saw, it's the first time I've never seen it before. I, I was at, when I was in Europe, I see all these pictures, and I was the only one dressed in a suit, and it was a great that <laughs> concert. Well, I, I don't want to say that at all. Anyway, but, uh, no, tell us, what did you teach? No, what I taught. Oh, 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 okay. Oh, you did, <laughs> good. So, uh, they were organic uh, mushrooms, uh, though. I won't tell them. But so, I'm glad uh, we're taping this, though, Abe. <laughs> Keep your back, keep the back, their back. <laughs> That's right. Well, you know, you want to know the funny twist of that? All the living Grateful Dead members who are, who still live in the area, they now wear three-piece suits. Because that's the twist. Now they're the countercultural people because they're dressed up in a suit and everybody else is wearing tie-dye. That's a true story. They are. Phil Lesh wears a suit. So I was going to read a little section of the book for you. Uh, this is the very beginning of the book, uh, conveniently titled Chapter One, and this is San Francisco. Perhaps the bicycle taxi driver spoke no English, or perhaps he was the trickster Loki in disguise, or perhaps he was simply tired of peddling around a passenger with a 250-pound trunk full of first edition 19th century novels. But after a 15-minute ride, Slater Brown's luggage was deposited on the curb in front of TK's bar in the Mission District, and he was presented with a bill for $87. As the pa bicycle taxi jingled off into traffic, Slater Brown smoothed his suit, stepped inside, and looked around. Upon first review, TK's wasn't exactly the literary place he'd hoped for. In fact, the only book any of the residents were reading was the Bay Meadows Racing Form. Nevertheless, it was at TK's bar in Simmer, beneath a faded photograph of Joe DiMaggio holding a stringer of tiny silver fish that Slater Brown first sat down and made the round wooden table talk. The talking table christened the noisy fucker years earlier by the sour-faced Irish barman known as Wilton had first exhibited its propensity to thump during an after-hours dice game of ship captain crew. The game, a not-to-be-missed ritual at TK's, had been played Thursday night since the Nixon administration. During one particular game, Sideways Sal had pounded on the table so hard as he was losing that one of the spindly table legs had inexplicably become shorter than the others. I wished I'd me a furnace, said Wilton at the time. But he didn't, and tilting the table sideways through the door and out into the open street was too much hassle for an aging man with a bum back, so he simply slid the round wooden table to the farthest corner where the extra glasses were stacked below the payphone and forgot about it. Tonight, the talking table, having finally found its muse, was impossible to ignore. It vibrated madly, sending up little explosions of dust and pencil shavings from the linoleum floor like hot grease as Slater Brown filled his yellow notebook with observations. It was the kind of thumping conversation that held no interest to the tired faces gathered alongside the bar. If they had lifted their heads to listen to the frantic sound coming from the corner, they would never have understood the language. Transcribed, the talking table told a secret unknown to anyone, for Slater Brown would never share it. 29, 29, 29. The very idea of it beat down on him with the weight of a thousand steel hammers. There was a kind of numerological destiny to 29. If you haven't anted up the chips of imagination by 29, he wrote, then what are you? Just a professional mourner, looking back, pulling away on the wrong train, your voice caught in your throat, unable to attract the attention of the impatient conductor. 
By the age of 29, James Baldwin and Saul Bellow and T.S. Eliot and Fitzgerald and Rilke and the pencil point crumbled. He'd been pressing too hard against the page. As Slater Brown paused to resharpen with his pocket knife, blowing the cedar shavings onto the floor, he couldn't help but look over his shoulder to see if anyone was watching. By the age of 29, he wrote, Hemingway and Chekhov and O. Henry had pulled themselves together for the world to see, walked to center stage, forgotten the lisp or canker sore, the bunched up underwear, their mother's stink eye, and killed, killed the audience. Yet here he was at 25, rising each morning, trying to pull forth some kind of original writing that would stand without support. There had been the one poem published in the Bartleby Review, but that had been in a special issue devoted to dyslexic writers. And he'd even had to fake that. For him, the worst part was the loathing. No, actually the worst part is the panic, turning each breath into a battle. Actually, the worst part was that he didn't even have the courage to admit to the world that what he wanted, more than anything, was to be a writer people would remember. He read the masters. He'd reread the masters. James Joyce had been quite explicit in a portrait of the artist as a young man. Welcome, O life, wrote Joyce. I go to encounter for the millionth time the reality of experience and to forge in the smithy of my soul but despite repeated attempts, Slater Brown found the smithy of the soul a lot harder to locate than Mr. Joyce had ever let on. The idea that you simply read everything, from the Bard to Balzac, from Cervantes to Conrad, picking up clues on how to write your own masterpiece is just bullshit, he wrote, because it leads you to believe that by following their footprints, you can learn the route in advance. But it doesn't work that way. Behind Slater Brown, a jubilant cheer went up at the bar as the residents watched a televised home run float out of the baseball park, a lonely predestined comet on its way to illuminate the inky darkness of the bay. Thank you. That's my reading.